Good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity for me to introduce to you Miss Ann Randall. This is one woman's legacy to capture her lived experience as an African-American government girl who became a statistician at the National Institutes of Health. My title of this um, presentation is titled Women and Underrepresented Minorities in Statistics and Data Science. There's an African proverb that says, until the story of the hunt is told by the lion, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And so today's focus, we're gonna focus on Ann Randall. She was an African-American government girl. Kimberly Crenshaw uses the term intersectionality to describe this phenomenon. As she says, if you're standing in the path of multiple forms of exclusion, you're likely to get hit by both. So in the case of Ann Randall, she was both an African-American woman and, um, and a woman in science. So African-American girls were standing in the margins of history with their backs against the wall. Um, they seized this opportunity to shift their, um, their employment from unpaid labor servitude to paid employment. Let's focus on Ann Randall, who unfortunately passed away um, a few weeks ago. So Ann Randall was born in 1925 and recently died um, in August, 2021. She was a mathematical statistician at the National Institutes of Mental Health um, in the theoretical statistics and mathematic, mathematic, math, mathematics branch. Um, she is responsible for the calculations behind the book titled Human Aging, which was published in, in the late 1960s. Anne Randall, as I said, was born January the 22nd, 1925 in Greenwood, South Carolina in the United States of America. She was employed as a mathematical statistician and she retired in 1974. She recently passed away August the 16th, 2021. This morning, I'm going to give you a little bit of, um, of a background of African-American government girls in the role that Ann Randall played. Um, we'll talk about discrimination and racism here in America and her contributions to um, the field of statistics and her legacy. Let's start with um, the way how I'm going to structure my talk is early beginnings, her entrance into the workforce, how she forged a new path um, for other women, and what she did in retirement. So most of you recognize this icon. This is Rosie the Riveter, and she was basically the star of the governmental campaign to recruit, to recruit female workers work in the nation's um, industry. Now, when you think of African-American women during World War II, most images will be women working in um, blue collar work. Um, for example, this woman was working at the munitions factory or um, they may have been domestic workers. And so that those were the only two choices for African-American women. But in the case of Anne Randall, Anne Randall's tenure as a maid was really short-lived. Her father interrupted this induction plan of becoming a domestic servant by saying, you're going to go to college. Um, no one in this family went beyond the third grade. And um, in spite of her mother's um, insistence on her becoming a maid, the daddy said, you're going to go into college. And sure enough, many, many years later, um, and did go to college, and this is how it started. She took the civil service exam secretly. She did not gain permission um, to take the secret, um, to, to take the civil service exam. So let's set the stage by looking at African-American 
uh, women in Washington, D.C. This um, occurred during the Great Migration, where thousands of young Black women traveled from the South um, to accept government appointment um, during World War II, federal civil service. We're talking about over 6 million African-American women. And these um, people, these brave women left the South and decided they were not going to live under the Jim Crow laws. Why is this um, story important? These are what we call absent narratives. Who decides to tell the stories? And so these women who were ready and able to work in the federal government took charge of their own destiny. So six years old, I wondered, who are these women? And my mother was basically a government girl um, coming all the way from Puerto Rico. So when I did my research on these women, I wanted to know two things. What was the experience of African-American women who were employed as the, um, during the federal government? And how did their impact change their, um, their economic and social mobility of not only themselves, but of their families? So Ann Randall took the civil service exam. She passed it with flying colors and began employment, paid employment, the federal government. I want you to know that on the very first day of um, employment, a wall was built around her. So you can imagine she is 16, maybe um, 17 years old, and she has passed this exam, but a wall is built so that she, as a young African-American girl, cannot be seen by white co-workers. So I have samples of um, African-American newspapers that advertised these, um, these government jobs. And these women took these jobs legitimately. They were found in African-American newspapers that announced civil service exams. So long before we um, have used words like grit and resilience, these women were really brave. And so Ann Randall became, took a job with the National Institutes of uh, Health, and um, she was responsible for major calculations in a book called Human Aging. Um, how did I get this information? Well, I used demographic um, information from yearbooks. I interviewed um, Ann Randall, um, looked at her employment records, family photos, all to kind of capture a story of this woman's life. Ann attended school in um, Washington, D.C. at Dunbar High School, where she was a brilliant student. She took uh, Latin, Latin one, two, three, and four, uh, biology one and two, and chemistry. And Anne was a straight A student. After school, um, she decided she was going to take the civil service exam and to basically change change her life. And so here's a quote that I took from my dissertation. Um, you know, a wall erected in front of her so that she could not work. Anne did not stay at that particular job for um, a long period of time. She was recruited by Dr. Donald Morrison to work at the National Institutes of Health. Now, the National Institutes of Health is located in um, Bethesda, um, Maryland. And Dr. Donald Morrison took Anne under his wing and taught her everything she knew about statistics. And as I, here's an aerial view of the National Institutes of Health. So I want you to imagine what it was like for um, a young woman in her early 20s who was being trained to be a maid landed at this uh, type of complex. Once and um, started working with Dr. Donald Morrison, she advanced her technical skills 
by attending um, classes at the Department of Agriculture um, through the NIH. And so here is a sample of um, what I would call an advertisement for night classes. So you can actually attend classes after work. And if you notice, there were several areas where she could advance her studies, biology, mathematics, and statistics. And again, here's another um, offering for classes. So not only did Ann Randall uh, take advantage of learning new skills every day, she actually attended classes offered through the Department of Agriculture Graduate School um, to keep her job at the uh, National Institutes of Health. One of the things I did notice is that the National Institutes of Health um, expanded their reach to, um, to retain African-Americans so they would um, send out advertisements um, through um, Howard University and other African-American colleges. Um, I took the opportunity to highlight some of the um, compliments and acknowledgements about Ann Randall and her work at the National Institutes of Health. Um, I apologize that I don't have the um, references here to share with you, but if you take a good look at how her work was appreciated by not only her coworkers, but lead um, statisticians. She worked at the Office of Biometry um, at the National Institutes of Health, and it was her expert technical analysis that is still um, used today. Um, here is one of the um, quotes that I like. We're indebted to Mrs. Ann T. Randall for her computational assistance um, in uh, preparing um, technical and academic papers. Here's, of course, a sample of a Frieden calculator. So you can imagine Ann Randall learning how to um, do these complex statistical um, calculations on a Frieden calculator. She once told me that a Frieden calculator was heavier than a broom or a mop or a dust rag. So she would rather work on a heavy machinery than, than hold um, a mop or, um, or some kind of cleaning um, implement. And again, for those of you who are um, knowledgeable about uh, statistics, look at those calculations. So here is a sample of some of her work that she um, did at the National Institutes of Health. So again, I conducted this historical case study for my dissertation. I wanted to construct an accurate historical account of the work that African-American women did during World War II. Um, I used a feminist lens to look at documents and to analyze their importance. Um, one of the things I know about um, doing historical research is that um, it is an attempt to correct inaccurate, distorted, or absent narratives um, of marginalized people. Um, one thing that I believe I, I know that it's important for people to recognize is that once these women like Ann Randall um, got their jobs, they secured their jobs and it changed the trajectory of, of not only their, their lived experience, but the legacy for their, um, for their children. They um, joined churches and they became socially active. Um, in their communities, um, and with the help of the National Council of Negro Women, um, they attended um, employment classes, they learned about workplace etiquette, um, everything in order to keep their jobs. 
And I want to also um, highlight the importance of faith-based faith -based organizations that really played a role in helping young ladies manage all of the racism, the institutional racism that they faced every day. Um, there were two major um, African-American sororities that played a role in making sure that these women held their jobs. So they launched programs like Hold On To Your Job in order to keep their jobs. Here's a sample of a wartime employment clinic where, again, women went to, um, to um, help, I, I think, build their confidence. I want to show you a picture of Ann Randall. Um, he is sitting, she's right here. And um, the, she joined a club called the Amaryllis Club. And the Amaryllis Club was um, a church-based uh, group. These are all women who worked for the federal government. And Anne always believed that it was important to give back to the community once she secured um, a job. One of my findings about working um, with these women is that um, once they settled into the job, they kept these jobs for life. And so most recently, and I want you really to pay close attention to this, the National um, Association of Statisticians, they developed an innovator award to recognize Ann Randall's trailblazing efforts in the field of statistical biometrics. And it, they recently um, awarded, um, they recently, I'm sorry, developed this uh, award in her name. And so I'm going to backtrack a bit by, by um, highlighting that in 1955, Ann Randall fulfilled her father's dream of attending college. And um, with the help of Don, Dr. Donald Morrison, she you know, went back to school and um, just sharpened her, her technical um, skills in statistics. One thing I'd like for you to, um, to really remember is that this happened, all of these events happened before Rosa Parks sat on the bus. So you can imagine what it was like for her to enter a workplace, you know, that, that had low expectations for uh, women of color. And... Um, I know that she has opened the door. She kicked the door open for other young statisticians, um, especially of color, to advance in a field that is um, predominantly perceived as um, white and male. And so um, I know I'm almost out of time. It's been a it was a pleasure and an honor, not only to meet Ann Randall, but to learn of her um, courage, her uh, activism. Um, she's a great, she was a great storyteller. And, um, you know, as I said before, she opened the door for other women of color and other, um, you know, um, genders to learn and strive in statistics. So I think I'm probably running out of time. Um, Dr. Althea, thank you for the opportunity to um, present. Thank this, you, um, it's a real pleasure. This is a Reader's Digest version of Anne Randall's life. Yes. Thank you, fascinating work. <laughs> and fascinating woman as well. Uh, is there, are there any questions for, for Aura? Yes, please. So her mother was born about the same time. Can you hear that? Or, uh, no, so her mother was born about the same time. And so um, she, she left school and she went to work in, in a legal firm. At the end of the war, she had a good job. But she was so this was in the UK, am I right? 
Yes, so did you hear the story? Or, uh, so her hear. mother, her mother worked at a, at a legal firm during the war, but then after the war, the men came back and, and took over their jobs. So how did they manage in the U.S. to keep their jobs? Okay. Well, this is interesting. Thank you for your question. The majority of white women went back to uh, they went back to to their homes, but African American women they realized that. This was paid employment. They uh, sharpened their, their, their academic skills. They held on to their jobs, particularly because what was the alternative? The alternative was to go back and to be domestics and they didn't want that anymore. So they, 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 fought, they fought to keep those jobs and held on to their jobs. Um, knowing that it would have made a difference, and it did make a difference um, in their lives. Does that answer your question? Oh. They were forced here, Laura. So that's oh, yes. No, the, the thing that um, probably protected these women who stayed in federal service was they had, there were civil servants. And so once they became vested in the organization, it was really kind of hard for them um, to let them go. Now, I believe, like in the case of my mother, that there were times when there was um, maybe like a reduction in force where they temporarily laid people off. But these women were smart enough to know, I'm going to do any and everything to keep this good government jobs. And that's that's what they referred to them as good government jobs. And um, they were protected as civil servants. So no one could really kind of push them out of the job. That's great. Um, Very good. Then. <clears throat> yeah. So another question, yeah, Alison. Just a comment on that. Um, that in the Civil War, the Okay. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, so, so Alison McFarlane from the history section is is saying that in 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 the UK the case was that once uh, the, these women married, they had to leave their jobs. It, this is in the government, isn't it? Yes, the marriage bar. And in teaching as well. Yes. Um. That was not the case here in in the United States. That. Um, you could be married and still hold on to your good government jobs. One of the things I probably neglected to share with you was that these women um, were held to a very high standard. They had to pass performance appraisals in order to keep their jobs. So it was just not, you know, you have your, you have a job and you have a job for life. They were routinely... Um, you know, evaluated and given performance appraisals. And so their appraisals were always, um, I would say, kind of off the charts. They were exemplary workers and exemplary um, employees. And so that little sheet of paper, that performance appraisal really helped them during um, tough times. Yeah, it's very interesting to see how different it was in the UK. Even with this woman facing racism, they have the security of their jobs, which they didn't have in UK. So it's, yeah, it's 
fascinating for me as a Spaniard, which uh, I mean, the conditions of women were even lower. I mean, all of these fights for for rights of the women are fascinating. Really. Right now, even though they 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 had um, these good government jobs, they still faced racism um, in the workplace. That didn't go away. But the fact that they were federal employees gave them a little bit of protection um, from from being fired. That's great. Yeah, that that, that is good news. Uh, almost all the bad news that they had to suffer. Yeah. Right. So thank you thank ever you. so much, Aura. Thank you for your fascinating story and for yeah. sharing all this. Thank you for having me. Thank you for extending um, the invitation. I hope to come over to the U to the UK and continue my research on what happened to women um, during World War II in London. So, um, so thank you for the, again for the invitation. Thank you. <laughs>